is there some truth to the uh, idea that termites produce a fair amount of methane? Ter uh, termites produce methane. It's not uh, even the number one, two, or three largest in the budget, but it's there. Of course, the th thing that you have to ask with that, you know, are therefore termites responsible for global warming? Unless we've had a remarkable increase in termites for some <laughs> reason, uh, they should have no effect at all. You know, there have always been termites, and they've always produced some methane, and and uh, the budget has always had inputs and outputs, and termites, uh, they've got to have changed to make a difference. Okay. Uh, Dr. Christie, has your opinion changed um, any since you signed the AGU position statement, or was the public, uh, or was the public position statement what you signed? Yes, I helped write the AGU statement from a couple of years ago, or four or five years ago. Yeah, could you, you just talk about what the AGU statement is? Hey, it says that, uh, Humans are having an effect on the climate. In fact, my quote on NPR was that it is inconceivable that with the addition of the aerosols that we put in the air, changing forests into farmland and throwing up uh, uh, other things into the air, including greenhouse gases, that the climate in some sense has not changed. That, that was my statement, so to speak. Uh, but, and Marv Geller was our chairman, and he was very clear about this. He said, we're not going to put the number on it. We're not going to quantify it. We just put the sign. In other words, yes, there is warming due to extra greenhouse gases. But we're not going to say how much. And I was very willing to sign that statement because I think the extra CO2 will indeed cause some temperature rise, but not one that we can pin down as a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your uh, thoughts about the direct correlation with global temperature and sunspot activity for the past thousand of years? thousands of years. There, yeah, there is a relationship between solar activity and, broadly speaking, temperature of the planet. The mechanism is still to be figured out. And so just making the sun hotter does not create enough joules of energy to make the system warm. There has to be some other indirect secondary effect that we don't quite know what it is. And so there is research today going on to say, well, if the sunlight goes up a little bit, does it trigger something that causes this sympathetic relationship with the Earth? But there is evidence that uh, there at least is a relationship. Here's a nice uh, factual question, uh, not that these others weren't, um, but uh, what is the best online site to get quantitative global temperature data? Um, and there's an asterisk here, unbiased, actual, and current. Well, I can easily answer that. It's the University of Alabama in Huntsville. <laughs> we have a paper. I think Science Express will be highlighting it to here uh, uh, this week or next week or something, where we once again go through an exercise of independent verification of our satellite work. And it's shown to be, compared with some other data sets, it's shown to be the most faithful to independent measurements. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are others out there, and I am writing the American Meteorological Society's report on upper air temperatures. I have seven data sets in there. Turns out they're all very, very close together. So the planet is warming about 0.14 degrees C per decade right now. Okay. Uh, and finally, our last question is to both speakers. So I'd actually like both of you to address this. Uh, what is the biggest challenge you face in communicating uh, climate change or, yeah, climate change to the public? So it's really a question about communication. I got to give two things on that. The first is, and we've seen this tonight, this, this is not simple. Uh, there are very sophisticated models, there are long-term data sets, there's geology involved, um, so that uh, this, is a, this is a very complicated system with a lot of people working on it with different disciplines that don't speak to each other quite well. That's my first response to that. The second is that the public, for one reason or another, has a large number of people represented there that really don't want to believe, regardless of the data, that humans are having an impact on climate. It's a deep-seated belief that this either couldn't possibly be happen, happening, or if it is, it's God's will, uh, and they don't, basically don't want to hear uh, what we often have to say. Okay. John? Uh, from my point of view, 
I think the most difficult challenge is dealing with a media that is very hard over on trying to alarm you and scare you about scenarios that are being thrust in your face and that every little study that comes along is solid, rock-hard evidence that the world is going to die, we're all going to die. That was expressed to me, by the way, by one of the New York Times reporters, that their editors require them to write stuff that sells newspapers. And mundane, low temperature rate, temperature data sets like ours just don't cross that bar. You have to be scary to get it in the newspaper. And so that is what my biggest challenge is. And who reads the newspapers? Congressmen, because his, his or her constituents read them. And so our legislators are also influenced tremendously by a media that is, that is biased heavily toward that which alarms. Okay, well, uh, why don't you join me in uh, thanking our speakers and... Uh... I want to thank you all for coming, and again, if you're interested in the John Locke Foundation, uh, just fill out that card, and if you're interested in conservation or environmental issues here in the Hickory area, uh, the Reese Institute for Conservation and Natural Resources at Lenore Ryan University. And, and, leave, and leave any of the material uh, that you're filling out for us at the front table. Thank you. <laughs>